then on behalf of uh, Norwegian user, uh, Unix user group and uh, NDLA, I want to welcome you all to this talk with Cable Green. Um, Cable is spearheading the Creative Commons movement on uh, what's uh, known as the Open Educational Movement, um, building upon a movement that started in the early 2000s with a group of people who gathered to create a framework to support students, scholars, um, researchers, uh, of course teachers, to create content under a free license. They all were heavily um, supported, or heavily inspired actually, by Richard Stallman. Um, and many out of this movement came many different free cultural movements, um, all uh, inspired by the licensing regimes for free software uh, at that time. Um, Cable, he is the director of Open Educational Resources for Creative Commons, but I would describe him more like um, OER Jedi, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the OER movement when it comes to Creative Commons, um, often providing simple answers to more complex questions. That is, that is the thing I sort of, the, the, the elements that, that always stand out is the simplicity of of, of complex questions. So, uh, with uh, no further ado, um, I want to welcome Capel Green. Did you want to mention that? Oh, yeah. Um, I also want to mention that we have a Norwegian uh, translation of the Lars Lessig book um, called Free Culture. Uh, Petter A. Nolsen and a group of, of very, very um, tiresome people translated this two years ago, I think, one and a half year ago. Yeah. So, and if you feel inspired by this talk uh, from Cable, this book is really the place to start because uh, Lawrence Lessig, uh, the professor from Harvard, uh, he was one of the instigators of the Creative Commons movement, really goes through many of the classical problems of copyright versus copyleft uh, in this book, dropping a ton of different examples that really sets issues and problems in perspective. So if you get inspired, and you probably will by Cable talking, you can go and grab the book, of course, for free, under a free license. If you want to read it in Norwegian, um, thanks to Petter and his crew, uh, you'll find it um, uh, on this link. So, please, Cable. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And I think several people are joining us in the live stream, uh, and or you might see this in a recording sometime in the future. So, welcome to all those different audiences. Um, here's the title for today's talk. We're going to talk a bit about the state of the commons, uh, but uh, as the director of open education at Creative Commons, I'll focus most of my comments on open education. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, my email is cable at creativecommons.org, or uh, my Twitter handle is at cgreen, and you can, you can get me there as well. Uh, of course, all of these slides are openly licensed. They uh, are under a Creative Commons attribution license, uh, and I've given a copy of the slides already to NDLA, and they'll share those out with anybody that would like a copy. Feel free to reuse them, remix them, whatever is most useful. So I'm going to talk about uh, four things today. We're going to talk about permissions, price, pedagogy, and policy. And apologies for all the Ps, but that's how it, that's how it came out. Um, and I also want uh, to give proper attribution to my uh, friend and colleague, David Wiley. David and I gave a version of this talk, although it's been modified for, uh, for the EU and for Norway in particular. Uh, we gave a version of this talk last December, so I always want to give thanks and proper attribution to our colleagues when we reuse uh, and remix their work. So we'll talk about these four things today. So before we get into talking about licensing or open education or policy or any of these, these, uh, <coughs> these ideas, here we are in uh, a university. Uh, one of the leading universities in Norway when it comes to technology, innovation, and free software. And uh, I always start with what education is fundamentally about. And education is about sharing. The best professors, the best teachers that we have are those that share the most completely. They're sharing knowledge, they share their research, they share their ideas, um, they empathize with students as they're learning. But fundamentally, education is about sharing. If you're not sharing knowledge, you're not sharing code, you're not sharing information, uh, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to be educated, to engage in the education process. Now, what's exciting is that we can educate at an unprecedented capacity today. And uh, just to go straight to it, it's because of uh, the internet, cheap disk space, 
uh, free and open source software and open licensing. So today, we can build an amazing education resource. We can build a, a piece of code. Uh, and we can share it with everybody on the planet for near marginal zero costs because we can move information at near speeds of light over the web because disk space is so cheap and we've got cloud computing. Uh, we can actually spend a lot of money and build something well once and then share it with everybody else on the planet. And that's different. Um, that hasn't always been this way. Except that we can't. Oftentimes, we run head on into copyright. And of course, uh, copyright exists in countries around the world. Nothing particularly wrong with copyright. Copyright is designed to both protect the author's right to, uh, to make something, to uh, sometimes commercialize it, uh, sometimes decide who gets to use uh, what. Nothing wrong with that. But what, 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 what about people that want to share? What about the uh, free software architects that want to share their code and have others improve on it? What about educators that want to share their educational resources and let somebody translate it into a different language or localize it for particular needs? So we've got all these amazing uh, capabilities with the internet and with cheap disk space. Uh, but a lot of these uh, things that the internet enables, copyright forbids. So for example, the internet makes it really easy to make copies of things, makes it really easy to store and distribute works. But copyright restricts copying. Copyright restricts making derivative works. Copyright restricts performing works. And so a lot of these rights, uh, technical rights that the internet gives us, copyright can take away. So a lot of times there's a confusion between open and free. And I think I've got lots of uh, free software people in the room, so I'm sure we'll have a debate about this later. Uh, but oftentimes, the general public confuses open and free. They think that if they find something for free on the internet, that it's open, that they can use it any way they want to. And of course, we know that's, that's not the case. Uh, most of the content on the internet is free in terms of no cost, although oftentimes we're paying a cost of looking at ads or giving our information away to a, a company. That information can disappear tomorrow. It can become a paid service. And oftentimes, when it's all rights reserved copyright, it can't be altered to meet our local needs when it comes to learning. Now, unfortunately, there was uh, just um, something that happened in the European Union just this past week. Um, this is a post on Communia's website, uh, one of the non-governmental organizations here in the EU. And here are, there, it's a bit more complex than this, but these were two of the articles that were uh, put up for proposal. We st it still has to go to for a full vote. But um, these are potentially very harmful for the way that the internet works. Uh, one of the uh, articles, Article 13, essentially requires platforms to now have uh, upload filters to filter out any copyright infringement which might occur. And on the surface, that probably sounds OK. The problem is a lot of smaller organizations aren't going to be able to afford the AI that does this. Even the large organizations don't do a very good job at, at copyright filters. And so this is a, a bit of a threat. Um, there was also this one I sort of boggles my mind. Uh, Article 11 um, essentially said you can't link out to, uh, to newspapers or other articles uh, or things like blog posts without permission without a particular license or without paying uh, a link tax. So this is something that, uh, that rolled out in Germany. And the idea is if I'm going to link to uh, to Oslo's main newspaper, um, I actually have to pay a fee to the newspaper to link to them. So now we're starting to charge, or potentially starting to charge for links, which fundamentally would break the way that the open internet works. So these are, um, this is a real problem. Now, we don't know if these are going to pass or not. There's been a lot of uh, opposition against these from the, from the commons community. We'll see where it goes. But that's not what open is. Open is not, fr is not free, precarious, rigid. Open's about permissions. And as was said in the intro, Creative Commons uh, and the permissions that are in CC licenses really come from the free and uh, free software community. Uh, the freedom to see the code and read the code, to make modifications to it, to share that code forward with others. All these ideas about uh, freedom of moving information around um, have been built into, the, into open licensing at CC um, and into open education. So when we're talking about uh, what we mean by permissions, in open education, we're talking about uh, what David Wiley coined the five R's. So the, the legal rights to retain a copy, 
to keep it forever, to reuse it in whatever way you might want to, to revise that work, change it, translate it into a different language, uh, mash it up and create something new. Um, a remix where I take multiple different works and remix them into a work that's going to be useful for me, and then the right to redistribute uh, to others. Uh, retain is, um, ironically, something you would think that all educators would have the right to retain a copy of things. But in fact, the new business models that are being rolled out by big publishers around the world now uh, seek to take retain away from people. So they're calling, uh, the, the big publishers are calling these uh, inclusive access or digital discount deals where they will come to your university and say, good news, we know that educational resources used to be really expensive and your students don't want to pay as much for textbooks. We will sell a license to the university uh, that you'll pay on an annual basis and that'll give everybody access. But the moment that you stop paying the license fees, we remove your access. So you lose the right to retain. So these are threats to the commons. This is a threat to the commons. These articles are a th threat to the commons. So how do we hack this? How do we get around these problems that, uh, that commercial, uh, oftentimes commercial business models where profit is the main goal, uh, how do we get around these so that we can get to the education systems that we want for our faculty, for our teachers, for our students? So um, I, I often refer to this as, as a hack. Creative Commons is really a hack on the copyright system. So this is where I work. I work at uh, Creative Commons headquarters. We're a nonprofit global organization. Uh, somebody asked me today where our office was, and the answer is we don't have one. Uh, my boss, our CEO, is in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I live just south of Seattle, Washington. Uh, our head of networks is in Chile. Uh, and uh, the person who helps set up CC country chapters around the world is in Nairobi. So we're all over the place. Uh, our office is where our laptop is and whatever plane we happen to be on at the moment. Uh, we've been around since 2001. That's when Larry Lessig and others founded Creative Commons. Uh, we operate worldwide. The licenses work everywhere. Uh, and we have CC country chapters, including CC Norway, uh, in countries all around the world. So here's why Creative Commons exists. Before CC uh, in the in open copyright license spaces uh, for for content. Let me, the, the caveat here is that the free and open software community was way ahead of this. They had open source software and free software licenses long before Creative Commons existed. So I want to be very clear about that. For those of us in education, which are uh, for the most part not coders and work with other educational stuff, we didn't really have any options other than the public domain. And in most countries, that means first the author has to die, and then roughly 70 years have to go by after their death before the work goes into the public domain. So that wasn't a very good option for sharing. And the other option was all rights reserved copyright, where I had to write bilateral license agreements with each person I wanted to share with, which also didn't work, because no educator is wealthy enough to employ their own attorneys to write licenses. So that didn't work well. So the idea of Creative Commons is was let's set something in the middle where authors can retain their copyright and they can share under a public copyright license, an open copyright license, under the terms and conditions that they choose. So if all you want is attribution, you can, you can have that. If you want to retain commercial rights for yourself, you can have that. If you want to share but not let people make changes to your works, there's a license for that. So we have these different license conditions. All the licenses require attribution. Share alike, the idea is if you take my work and you modify it, you must share the derivative work under the same terms as the original. That's everything on Wikipedia is under a, a buy, a, an attribution share alike license. Non-commercial is the authors retaining commercial rights for themselves and the public can't make primary commercial use of the work. And then no derivatives is you can't change the work. When you mix and match those different conditions, you get one of six Creative Commons licenses. We also have two public domain tools. We have a tool called CC0, which is a public domain dedication. So if you want to give up your copyright and put the work directly into the public domain, you can do that. Um, that has become the standard for not only government works in many countries, but also for uh, for data, particularly open data, and data that goes with academic research. Uh, most data is not copyrightable in the first place, although in Europe you have database rights uh, that many countries don't have. But CC0 is a way to make sure that data and the databases are in the public domain. When we think about the licenses in terms of educational resources or open educational resources, OER, we stack them up like this. So th certainly the, the most 
free, the most permissive is the public domain. There's not even a requirement to provide attribution, although that's still the best practice to do so because we don't want to plagiarize. We give credit to other people's work. And then you go down the list. The, the next most permissive is the CC BY license and then BY SA, BY NC, and down the line. In education, we stay away from the no derivatives licenses because they violate those five R's permissions. If something has a no derivatives license on it, you can't revise or remix it. And so we say that's not OER. So we're, we're fairly strict about that in the open ed community. Uh, whenever possible, we try to either get works in the public domain or under a CC BY license. And when I say whenever possible, what I mean is when we're working with policy and governments and funders, we try to get the most permissive license we can on works to maximize downstream flexibility and reuse of those works. I'll come back to policy in a minute. So we, uh, we like to say we put the open in OER because the open educational resources around the world tend to be either in the public domain or have a CC license on it. There's lots of CC license uh, works online. There's uh, at latest count over 1.2 billion. This is a fairly conservative number. Uh, if you want to see how this number changes year over year, you can go to our state of, state of the commons report that we publish annually. So we've talked about open educational resources. What, what do we actually mean here? Uh, educational resources is kind of all the stuff that you use here at the university when you're teaching a class or when you're building a degree program. When we're talking about open educational resources, we mean something very specific. We're talking about those educational resources that are either in the public domain or are under an open license that allow those five R permissions. So it allows me no cost, free use to get access to that resource, and it gives me the legal rights to modify it, to adapt it, to adopt it, to meet my local needs. So when we choose open educational resources instead of closed resources, what the internet enables, open actually permits. We actually can make a million copies of that really great calculus textbook. We actually can modify it and translate it into uh, Kiswahili because that's what we need in a particular village in Kenya. So that's a bit about permissions. Let me shift over to price. Um, I'm from, uh, from the United States. I use a, a bit of data from, from my country. Uh, in the United States, two-thirds of students make decisions every day not to buy textbooks because they're too expensive. Uh, half the students in my country uh, say that textbooks are impacting how many and which classes they take. So there's two important ideas here. I wanted to take three classes because I'm trying to graduate sooner, trying to get a better job, trying to... Uh, you know, have a better, get a promotion or whatever it might be. But I can't afford the textbooks in the third class, so I guess I can only take two. That's part of what's going on here. The other really sad thing that's going on here is I really wanted to be an electrical engineer. That was my hope and my dream, but I looked into the cost of educational materials in electrical engineering, and it's just too expensive. It happens all the time in the medical sciences, in nursing, uh, in, uh, in MD fields, uh, happens in computer science. Uh, where the materials oftentimes are prohibitively expensive. Uh, and 82% of students, uh, students are not stupid. They say, look, if I had access to all the educational resources that my faculty, that my teachers designed for me to be successful and are asking me to buy, if I had all that stuff, I would do better. Right? So the students know this. So this, is a, this fundamentally is an equity issue. Um, just to, to get right to it, students that have a lot of money do just fine. Students that don't run into these problems. So when we're talking about open educational resources, part of what we're getting at here is equity and inclusiveness, giving everybody a fair shot at an education by ensuring that all of the effective, high-quality educational resources that are being designed for the students are freely and openly available to them. So there's projects all around the world. We don't have uh, time tonight to go through all of them. But there's big projects that deal in open educational resources. Uh, this is one called OpenStax. They build open textbooks that are CC BY licensed for highest enrolled courses. And these are used all over the planet. Uh, in 2018, they saved students over 145 million US dollars. Uh, this numbers, th these numbers are outdated. It's now up, I think, around 170. Um, one of the other interesting things that we're seeing is that open resources are now beating closed resources in terms of quality. And so um, also in the United States, um, we, <laughs> so the United States, I'm embarrassed to say, 
our primary and secondary students are way behind the rest of the world in terms of math and science. We just haven't done a very good job. So there was an overhaul of the academic standards uh, in, in my country to improve those standards, to really raise the bar. That meant we needed new content. The estimates were that uh, collectively, the public schools were gonna spend 8.5 billion, so billion with a B, US dollars to create the educational resources that were aligned with these new academic standards, if they bought them, if they procured them in traditional ways from publishers. Those, those of us that worked in education said, now, oh, wait a minute here. We're talking about two subjects and 12 grades, 24 courses, and we're going to spend $8.5 billion of public money to build 24 courses? That is insane. How much does it cost? Is it $10 million a course? So that's $240 million. It's not 8.5 billion. So this is a project that took $10 million. They're starting to build out math and writing courses that align with these new standards. And they are, they're, they're all CC by license. They're all freely available to anybody that wants to use them. And they're beating all of the publishers. So there are independent reviews of these resources and all the publisher resources. These came out on top. So you know, one of the critiques of OER is, oh, well, if it's free, you get what you pay for. It must be garbage. And the answer is, no, if you build things well, it's good stuff. I mean, free software, people have known this forever, right? The reason everybody uses Linux on their servers is it's the best, right? You don't use other things because it's just so stable. People find bugs. Why? Because it's open. The code is open. Uh, here are some other tools which might be of interest to you if you care about the cost of textbooks. Uh, Lumen Learning has a great, uh, they call it a, a, an impact calculator. You can plug in all sorts of variables about what the costs of your textbooks are, how many students you have, et cetera, and it tells you how much money your students would save. In Canada, they've got something uh, called Z degrees or Z degrees, and they call it Z cred, uh, Z for Z, zero textbook costs. They're running entire degree programs where all of the content are open educational resources to ensure that all students have access to all the resources they need to succeed. When we look at universities, the, the breakdown of all the stuff we use kind of looks like this. So we use commercial textbooks. Those are really expensive. The permissions, restrictive. We can't make modifications to it. You can't improve it. You can't translate it. You don't have those rights. Library resources are usually free for the students and the faculty, sometimes free for the public, if the public can make it here physically. But the rights are oftentimes all rights reserved copyrights. So that's restrictive. And if we stop paying the licensing fee to the journals or whatever resources we use, we lose, we lose access to those. Open educational resources, you get both free access and you get permissions. Now let's shift to pedagogy. I think we actually have a director of open pedagogy in the room here. Um, so pedagogy is all about the practices of teaching and learning. What can we do in the classroom? What can we do online with students? And how do we design? What's the instructional design around the learning space? And how do we engage and interact with students as they're learning? So the question when we're talking about open pedagogy is, what does open allow me to do that closed doesn't allow me to do? And so again, back to our friend David Wiley. David likes to say, we learn and we do things. Copyright restricts what we do. And so if copyright is restricting what we do, then it's restricting how we're permitted to learn. And if open removes the copyright restrictions, then open permits us to learn in new ways. So for a couple of years, David's been talking about what he calls disposable assignments. So a disposable assignment is like when I used to be faculty a long time ago at Ohio State University, I would give assignments to my students. I'd say, here's how you're going to be graded. They would turn those assignments into me. I would grade them, give it back to the students. They would throw the assignment away. I would throw the assignment away. That's a disposable assignment. Disposable assignments are depressing. Nobody likes to do them. They didn't do anything to improve the planet. They didn't improve uh, the future cohorts of students. Hopefully, somebody learned something, but pretty much everything got tossed. Right? So that's no good. Um, David estimated that just in the US alone, students spend approximately 40 million hours a year doing homework on disposable assignments. Okay, so that's a little bit depressing. What if the assignments were renewable? What if the content was actually open? What if students, rather than saying, hey, turn in a report that I'm going to throw away on chapter two in your chemistry, what if the assignment was, um, there are five cutting edge articles on chemistry that just came out in open access journals. I want you to read those, review them, summarize them, 
properly cite them, and update chapter two in our book so that our textbook is up to date with the latest research. Very different assignment, right? So what if, um, so full disclosure, my doctorate's in education psychology, so I, I uh, get, I care about this stuff. Um, I care about how people learn, I care about how they learn. And what we know uh, from, if you boil down 50 years of ed psych research, um, essentially people learn when they're in authentic lear learning spaces, when they're in spaces that are real, where their work's gonna matter, and they learn when they're motivated, which flows from being in an authentic learning space. And so everybody wants to feel like the work that they're doing matters. And if you're giving me a disposable assignment, I don't really care very much. I know you're gonna throw it away. So what if learning was shifted a little bit and was about solving things like this? So these are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. What if rather than learning chemistry, what if I was also learning chemistry, but I was studying uh, climate action as well? What if uh, rather than just studying electrical engineering, I was studying how to get uh, more effective and efficient uh, photo cells for uh, solar cell technology or for hybrid car batteries? I've seen lots of hybrid cars driving around Oslo. What if rather than just studying uh, political science, I was studying how to build sustainable cities and communities and how to work with politicians and government in that endeavor, right? All of a sudden now, as students, I'm starting to engage. I'm learning the, I may still be learning the same subjects and the same topics and gathering a lot of the same knowledge for my degree program, but I'm actually working on meaningful problems uh, that everybody is working on together in the world. These are called the UN SDGs. They've been agreed upon by the UN General Assembly and everybody's working on them. Last, we're gonna talk about policy. So to jump to the punchline here, all publicly funded resources should be openly licensed. When the government of any particular country funds uh, software to be developed, that software should have a, a free and open source software license on it. When the government funds educational resources to be build, those, uh, built, those, those uh, resources should be under a CC BY license so that the public that paid for the thing has access to what they paid for. So the good news is this is happening. Uh, national, provincial, state governments are starting to put these open license requirements on publicly funded resources, on publicly funded educational resources, on publicly funded research, um, on publicly funded data sets. So this is a, this is a good, uh, good uh, momentum we're seeing. There's a lot of work to be done left. Foundations are doing this as well. So for example, the Hewlett Foundation requires a CC BY license on everything that they fund. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has what I would argue is the best open access policy on the planet, where if you take research money from the Gates Foundation, you have to uh, publish and make available your research with zero embargo period. So the moment your research is published, everybody in the world gets access to read it. Gates thinks that's important because if people can't read the research, like, what's the point, right? <laughs> you never know who's going to have the best great idea about how to cure malaria unless you give everybody access to read the article on malaria. Um, they also, in, in addition to the zero embargo period, they require a CC BY license uh, on the article itself. That's not so people can, it's not so that people can go remix or revise the article. It's so that future scientists can text and data mine the article. So for example, if I wanted to do, get up to date on research in my field, there's probably 100,000 articles I'd have to go through from the time that I taught education psychology way back in the early 2000s. I can't physically, there aren't enough hours in the day to do all that, but I can have my computer program go do a pattern recognition analysis with a bit of AI and bring me back a report, some summaries of those 100,000 articles telling me where I might further investigate. To do that, I'm actually making copies of those articles. I'm making derivative works of those articles. I've just violated copyright 100,000 times if those articles aren't openly licensed. The third thing that Gates did is it said all the data, all the research data has to be made open as well. Why? That's how we do science. If you can't uh, replicate somebody else's data to prove that it might be false, it's probably not a very good study. So if I've got access to your data, not only can I get into your study at a much deeper level um, to, to replicate it and prove that it's, uh, it's either true or not, that's important. What if I wanna do a meta-analysis um, of 100 different studies? If I've got access to all the data sets, I'm able to do that. Uh, Europe, I'm happy to say, is out on front on this. This was announced a couple weeks ago, uh, something called Coalition S. 
And uh, what they're doing here, this was uh, announced on September 4th, 11 national research funding organizations with the support of the European Commission and the European Research Council announced the launch of Coalition S. This is an initiative to make full and immediate open access to research publications a reality. So here's what they said. As of January 1st, 2020, all scientific publications that are, result of, that are the result of publicly funded research grants by national and European research councils and funding bodies must be published in a compliant open access journal and or other OA platforms. And then if you get into, they've got 10 principles about the specifics about what they mean on this. And I just pulled out one of them because it was about open licensing. But they said, look, authors should retain their copyright. Um, if possible, put a CC by license so that people can text and data mine it. And then they've got nine other principles which are all right in line with best practices. So this is a really good thing. And the reason that this policy stuff matters is if you change the rules on the money, you change behavior. If you tell coders, if you take money from the Norwegian government to build new software, and if you do that, you have to put a free software license on it, they'll do it, right? Even if maybe they didn't want to in the first place. Change the rules on the money, people do different things. So aside, set open policy aside for a minute. What if you can't get your government to pass a new policy? That's hard, it takes time uh, at the national level or at the provincial or the state level. What can you do here at this university or what can that one school do? We have power locally in addition to nationally. And the power we have locally is we write contracts all the time to procure stuff. So NDLA is a good example of this. When NDLA wants to buy digital uh, learning materials, oftentimes they will put out a tender or an RFP and they'll say, here's some money, here's what we need. We're gonna put this out into the market and we want the best product at the best price. So, and we'll specify exactly what we want. And part of the terms of the contracts are that we, NDLA, are going to own the copyright to what we're purchasing. And then we're going to have an internal policy that says we're going to put a Creative Commons license and share those works. Right, so this is what we do. We, we build by commission what we need. We own what we buy. We keep the copyright. And then we share what we own. Or put more simply, buy what you need, own what you buy, and share what you own. We were talking uh, a little bit earlier today about the, the steps people go through with OER. And step one is use other people's OER that's all ready to go and you don't need to make any changes. That's maybe 10% of what we need in any particular university. Step two is use other people's OER that you can remix and revise. Maybe I need to translate it into Norwegian. Maybe I don't like the examples in it. Maybe I don't like the order of it. I need to modify it somehow. Step three is you build. What local talent do you have here at the university or regionally? Uh, across uh, Norway or maybe Scandinavia. Uh, and then the next step is open procurement. You pay somebody else to build the stuff for you, but don't give up the copyright. If you're paying for it, you should own it. And then hopefully you'll also openly license it. So just a few final slides and then I'll, I'll stop and we can have a conversation. So what specifically can this and other universities do to support open education and OER in particular? One is just raising awareness, having events like this, um, having a conference at your campus, have a national meeting where you tell people about this stuff because frankly, most people don't know. Um, they don't know about open education. They don't know about open access. Oftentimes they don't know about free software or open data. You have to tell them and awareness raising events go a long way. The next thing is ask your university for support for your faculty, for, for the teachers, for creation, adoption, sharing um, of OER. Right? And there's different grants that you can give out in each of these categories. Talk with your government about funding, um, about doing these same things. Uh, so for example, the, uh, the New York governor just gave um, another $8 million to the, uh, the SUNY and CUNY systems, which are the state universities and the community colleges in New York State. Why? Because they want to incentivize the creation, adoption, and remixing of OER. And so they're putting real money on the table, and that money is used for uh, release time, so faculty have time to do this work. Sometimes it's used for new projects to build things. Sometimes it's just time to go out and find other people's OER and bring it in and modify it and make it their own. So, um, so think about getting funding, and there's no reason to do this alone. 
right? Anything that's open is sort of global by nature. You might think about having a Norwegian initiative. You might think about a Scandinavian-wide initiative. I, I posted today on social media that I was in Norway, and two people in Sweden were like, hey, when are you coming over here? Like, <laughs> you're right around the corner. And I was like, yeah, yes, and you should talk with the Norwegians about the work that they're doing. There's no reason to, to do this alone. Um, we need to look at promotion and tenure. Faculty will behave and act in ways that the incentive structures tell them to. And promotion and tenure at, at universities and at colleges, for the most part, tells faculty what they should do is publish in the most prestigious journals that they can and write a book, and that's how they're going to get promotion and tenure. For the most part, that's what university promotion and tenure systems say. Oftentimes, uh, P&T policies are silent on anything open. So when faculty publish in open access journals, fine, that's, maybe that's the same as long as it's prestigious. Uh, sharing your educational resources under a CC license, yeah, maybe that's nice, we don't know, but we're not gonna give any points for that. And so uh, oftentimes promotion tenure is neutral on these topics. When promotion tenure is positive about them, guess what happens? Faculty start to publish in open access journals. Faculty are more willing to share their educational resources. And there's real arguments to be made to the deans and to the provosts of universities and to the department chairs to encourage openness. Uh, usually promotion and tenure is based on three things, teaching, service, and research at most universities. I could argue that, uh, that open educational resources or sharing my educational content openly certainly is about teaching. I'm helping my students and I'm helping other people's students. Certainly there's a service component to that. I'm sharing and I'm helping other people, probably in other countries, get access to high quality educational resources I'm producing. And when it comes to research, if we're publishing our, our research data openly, and if we're publishing our articles in open access journals, there's an argument to be made that my impact, and the, therefore the university's impact, is greater than if I'm publishing in closed journals that only the richest universities in the world can access. Another very practical thing that you can do at the university is to tag OER courses somehow in the course catalog and give that information to students. So we were talking uh, earlier today, what was the name of the app, uh, the Fix My Street? Fix My Street, right? We're talking about Fix My Street, this great app where you're driving down your street and you hit a pothole and you can say, hey, I got a pothole and I want my, uh, my city commission to know about it so that they'll come fix the street, right? And it, it creates a new re positive relationship between, uh, between the public and the government officials um, that provide these services. And so when we tag, and that, that information is good. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes the public officials uh, may not want that kind of attention. But hey, that's, that's transparency for you. That's the free flow of information. Um, and the same thing's true about uh, tagging OER in your course catalogs. When you provide this information to students, guess what they do? They want those courses. Now, sometimes that's uncomfortable for faculty, because the faculty that are not doing OER oftentimes see their course enrollments go down. Because if textbooks are expensive, and if there are seven sections of intro to statistics that I can choose from as a student, and three of those sections are tagged with OER, and I know that the textbooks are going to be free, and I probably know that I'm going to engage in some open pedagogy, which is way more exciting than my other courses where I've got disposable assignments, I'm going to choose the OER classes. Right? And so this is a powerful tool to not only raising awareness among faculty, but giving students the tools that they need to make good decisions. You're going to get asked about the sustainability of open education. And this question drives me nuts. Um, I used to work for universities uh, in various states, and I, wor I worked for a community college, uh, system of community colleges as well. And my answer to this was always, um, our job in public education institutions is to provide all the students we can, as many as we can, with the highest quality education, including the highest quality of content. And the best way that we know how to do that is with open educational resources, because we can spend a lot of money and resources once, put a CC BY license on it, and then share those resources with everybody for the marginal cost of zero. So our example, when I, my last job before Creative Commons, we had, I worked for community colleges in, in my state of Washington, uh, where uh, just, uh, where are we? We're just north of Oregon, just south of British Columbia, if you don't know where Washington is. And uh, 
we looked at our general education curriculum. We then looked at just our highest enrolled course. One course. Our highest enrolled course was called English Composition. It was a basic writing class. Everybody took it. 55,000 students a year from 34 colleges took this class. The cost, the amount of money they were spending in US dollars on textbooks just for writing 101 was $8.2 million a year. Okay? A third of that was coming right out of the state general funds that was subsidy for the students' financial aid. A third of it was coming from the US federal government in financial aid. And a third of it was debt. Students were taking on debt that they were going to pay high interest rates on when they left school. Okay, so we went to our government, our, our local government, and we said, this is a problem. This is insane. What we're doing today is not sustainable. This is, it. This is crazy. We're spending $8.2 million a year every single year buying one textbook that everybody needs. Why don't we spend like $100,000, hire faculty to build a really great OER that covers, it's better than what we use now, and put a CC BY license on it and give it away to everybody for free. And if people don't like it, it's got an open license on it, they can modify it and make it their own. So we did that. We took the, the cost from 8.2 million a year, and now the marginal cost is zero. Right? We spent a little bit of money to keep those resources updated. So when people talk about sustainability, you have to look at the money. Look at the ROI or the return on investment for what your university or college is spending now for educational resources. Right? And this includes building curriculum for classes. And what would that ROI be if it was open? Okay, that's the way to look at sustainability. I want to invite everybody who's watching this and everybody in the room here at the university, um, if you'd like to be involved in an international conversation about open education, Creative Commons hosts something called the CC Open Education Platform. If you go to your favorite search engine, just type in CC Open Ed Platform, you'll, you'll find it and how to sign up. It's free, there's no cost to this. This is a space, it currently has, I think, 810 people from over 70 countries around the world. And this group is only working on projects that are international in scope, uh, open education projects in content practices and policy that we all need. So that's what we're doing. Here's my information again. Thanks, everybody. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come. Thank you. And do we have time for questions? Yeah, great. Um, so cool that you brought up a Fix My Street. Uh, the guy creating it was he's actually here, called Peter. It was, uh, I think, oh. Peter and his wife. Awesome they just app. gave birth to one child, or they did not, she did. Uh, <laughs> but as they just became parents, they actually launched Fix My Street. And that really disrupted um, communication between the public and <laughs> municipalities in Norway uh, in, a, in a great way. If anyone would, able to, would be able to do that with OER, that would be great. Um, and I think in, in some ways we can claim the fame for that in Norway from, from NDLA's, uh, NDLA's side. Uh, any questions from the, from the audience? Uh, now is the time. Better, of course. Now we have a mic for you. One thing you didn't mention about open uh, publishing is the problem with uh, crap research, basically. And the predatory uh, article, uh, the predatory um, uh, Journal. journals, uh, which is basically a byproduct of the openness we all like. Uh, do you have any idea how to, well, reduce the problem, avoid it, hopefully? Yeah. So, um, I would say they're, that they're two different things. So, predatory journals could be open or closed. Um, so it's not, so predatory journals for people who don't know, these are, you know, we all get these emails if you work at a university that says, please publish in my journal. Um, I can guarantee you publication, it'll be good for your career, it'll help you get promotion and tenure. There's all these promises about publishing, right? And then when you dig into it, you find out that it's some fake journal. Really what they want is uh, they want some kind of fee for publication. They want an article processing charge. They're called APCs. Um, sometimes they're promoted as, as open journals, sometimes not. Sometimes they're, they're promoted as closed journals. So um, setting aside the licensing for a minute, predatory journals are problematic and should be identified by the community and shut down wherever possible, or at least ignored. Um, where they are 
uh, where there are open access predatory journals, um, the community needs, I think, needs to deal with them in the same way. So there are uh, things like the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ, that maintains a list of open access journals. Uh, and it's up to us in the open community to, you know, to provide guidance and uh, about where the good stuff is, including where the, the good open access academic journals are. I don't know if I answered your question, though. Yeah, yeah. So I, um, I try to follow things around science and uh, popular science and what's going on. And uh, something that I've heard about is something called the um, replication crisis or the reproducibility crisis in certain sciences where people seem to fail to, to reproduce earlier results. Uh, I think it's especially bad in psychology, but as far as I've understood, it's also something that has shown its ugly head other places. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts on how this can affect that situation? So I'm not familiar with the... So tell me more about the reproducibility crisis. Spell that out for me. What does that mean? Um, uh, certain, uh, as far, okay, I, I'm not deeply into this. This is huh? just something that I've uh, absorbed, you know, by huh? osmosis. Uh, um, let's say in psychology, it's certain landmark and, and also major uh, um, uh, uh, papers over the years have it's turned out that when people try to reproduce those tests, this, this is also this is true for social, social sciences and for psychology especially. Uh -huh. They find it that reproducing those tests are really difficult. And, and, and they've looked at both if this is because they are mostly uh, doing the, their tests on uh, university students, yeah. like, which isn't a good population uh, that's to begin with, right. but also methodologically and uh, also around how the, the whole process around the quality of the research turns out. Right. And as far as I've understood, uh, one major uh, clue that they are trying to, uh, um, a major thing they're trying to do to address this problem is to uh, upfront declare what their uh, research is going to be about and then choose to publish the result no matter the success. Instead of just like removing every failed uh, 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 trial or failed experiment yeah. and just producing the successes, yeah. they decide to say, okay, we need to also to see the, the, the failures so we can actually learn not just from the successes. Right. So um, most people would argue that the failures are more important than the successes, right? Um, so yeah, the so you bring up several important points. Um, if an if if an earlier study, which might be held in very high regard by the by a particular discipline, if it can't be reproduced, and maybe if the n was too small, or the the sample they used was just university students, which wasn't representative of the population they were making claims about, or the data collection was bad. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why it might not be a good study. That's important to know, right? And yes, that might be disruptive in a discipline to say this, this hallmark study, which we've all read and relied on for all these years, turns out not to be a very good study. Hey, that's science, right? That's, <laughs> that's the way that science is supposed to work. Um, I, it's funny you bring this up. I was, I think it was last year I was listening to uh, I was driving to the airport, I'm listening to National Public Radio, and there was a story on this very topic, and it was about stem cell lines that are used for different types of research. So in biomedical resource, research, everybody uses stem cells these days to try to uh, figure out how to cure different disease states or figure out which genes activate. I'm not a biologist, so I, I don't really know what I'm talking about here, but... Um, st stem cell lines are used in, in, in biology and, and, uh, and uh, developing new drugs and figuring out the human genome, all those types of things. What the story was about was that um, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, which funds most of the biomedical research in the U.S., had been giving 
you know, billions and billions of dollars to people to uh, purchase stem cell lines and then do the research and then publish their articles about various kinds of cancer and, and recommended treatments, et cetera. And what they found out was that several of these stem cell banks, so there's labs that all they do is produce stem cell lines. So here's liver stem cell lines, and here are stem cells from the pancreas, and here are stem cells from the lung. So it's really important that you have the right stem cell line. So if you're studying lung cancer, you'd better be dealing with lung stem cells and not liver stem cells or heart stem cells. That, that's important, right? What they figured out was that the stem cell lines they had for these research, in many cases, were not the stem cells that they thought that they had. Right? So the research was fundamentally wrong. Right? The, the core tools they were using, these stem cell lines, were inaccurate. The con there was a meeting with the National Institutes of Health and a lot of these researchers. And the conclusion, I kid you not, was, oh, well, that was really bad, but let's just let all that research stay where it is, and we'll try not to make the same mistakes in the future. I about crashed my car I was driving to the airport when I heard this because I thought, no, that's not the right answer. The right answer is all that research is, is bad research. Like, it, it's not accurate. It, how can you let research remain that's about curing breast cancer when the stem cells they were using was, were from the heart or the liver or <laughs> something that had nothing to do with breast cancer? And so there's this, um, I mean, I don't know, arrogance, fear of going back and questioning uh, form, you know, uh, published research in our disciplines that we have to get over. And a big part of that, I, you know, I think that's part of the power of openness is that you are opening up your software code, you're opening up your textbook, you're opening up your research, not only for people to see it, but to point out the bugs and to say, here's how this could be better, or, hey, this is just flat out wrong. And that's really scary. So when we talk in education about the shift, the cultural shift from, from closed to open, closed is very safe and comfortable. Closed is I'm in my classroom and my door is closed and I have my 45 students and I don't have to, you know, if I'm making mistakes, my students probably don't know and it's not on the internet and, and I, I don't have to take your critiques because you can't see what I'm doing or what I'm talking about or claims that I'm making, right? When you open stuff up, everybody gets to see it. Now, those of us, you know, in the room here that work in open and work in the commons, uh, we believe that uh, openness is better for that reason, so that people can find the mistakes. Does that answer what you were getting at? Yeah. Okay. I'll try to find the stem cell thing for you. It'll blow you away. <laughs> Sorry, I'm actually going to uh, uh, um, dig further into that stem cell uh, thing. Um, so what you're saying is that that uh, or or what what are you saying that that research should be unpublished or what's uh uh, so what I was, so I should, we should take a minute. Let me. Okay, I can I can make my. Um, I, I, yes, I'm saying I, I that can, research can, I, should be called faulty if we know that it's faulty. Yes, because because that's no, it shouldn't be retracted. That's my argument. It should be marked. That's really important. Yes, yes, I think you're right. Because it's uh, still it's still I, published research. Yeah. No, I, I just uh, I just uh, researched uh, or uh, did something following an article that actually had a uh, correction. Yeah. Um, very very interesting. Um, so we did something wrong in in that in that formula. Uh, it didn't really work out, but actually it doesn't uh, it doesn't change the results. It just you need these calculations have to be done in that matter, uh, but still the research is valid. So I think it's more important to actually say that okay, this is there there, there this is questionable rather than actually unpublishing it. Fair enough. Uh, leave it published, mark it. But, but I would argue that if you were doing research on liver cancer and you were using lung stem cell lines when your research was assuming you were using liver stem cell lines, I think that's a fundamental problem. Yeah, and, and we should, there should be big flags on the article that says, warning, <laughs> here's what happened. I agree with all the things about flags and uh, etc. But the thing about stem cells is that uh, they can go in any direction. But then at some point in their development, they get fixed in yeah. one direction. 
but uh, as long as you call it stem cells, it actually means it can go in many different directions. So therefore, uh, um, stem cells. Well, what's true about stem cells will be true for many, many cells, or many, many uh, different generations of cells later. So, uh, but the more specialized they become, the more fixed they become in one path of evolution or cell evolution, and then it then it's more difficult. But um, uh, also, cancer cells is um, you know they are less organized and less specialized into uh, organs and so on. So therefore, uh, what's true about uh, stem cells or, ca or cancer cells from stem cells that will be valid for many many different kind of cells. Interesting. So, so maybe less of a flag on the articles. Yeah, yeah. I th think it's perfectly valid to try to use those early results in the, in a bigger context later and not throw it away. You, you bring up uh, you bring up an important uh, point about flagging. I I actually haven't gone back and looked to see if the articles have been flagged or not, but that would be an interesting exercise to do. One question myself yeah. um, that you that you you mentioned it in your example with the eight million dollars a year yeah. on, on on the English class, uh -huh. and there are some. I mean, as in software, well, you have some components in a system that is general, used in almost all devices. You have the same thing in some subjects, in upper secondary school and in and and also in the in the lower grades like math. You have calculus in all languages. They're not completely the same, but they're built around the same logic. Um, and I think if you take your math on the eight million and you take that over a country, the number will be higher. Could you share some some thoughts on actually would it be that simple to create one math course? Like maybe in seven or eight versions that could be reused around the, uh, the globe. Sure. So t t technically and legally, it is that simple, right? So if if somebody wanted to build, and this happens all the time, if somebody wanted to build a uh, a geometry textbook or course and put an open license on it and make it OER, you can share it with everybody this afternoon. Right, so that's we know that can be technically done, and we know it can be legally done with CC licenses. The question is really, um, will teachers and faculty and countries accept it and use it? Will they adopt it? And that's where it gets a little tricky. <laughs> so the academy tends to be, um, uh, and they should be, very careful to hold on to their academic freedom. So academic freedom is critical in any university uh, so that uh, the, the faculty can teach uh, and, and uh, share ideas that they want to that are not um, overtly influenced by any particular government or political agenda or, or whatever, uh, whatever might affect an education system in a way that we don't want liberal arts education to be affected. And so um, faculty, when they're looking at adopting content, most faculty will say to you, if you want me to adopt something new, you have to give me several choices. So, and I'd like to see a minimum, usually people say to me, I'd like to see a minimum of three choices. So, uh, Cable, you sold me on the idea of open educational resources. It all makes sense. I like the idea of having five hours permissions. I like the idea of all of my students and not just some of my students having access. Like, I get all the ideas. That's good. But don't just give me one choice. Don't, I teach calculus, don't just give me one calculus textbook. I want to see 10 calculus textbooks that are all openly licensed. And I might even want to remix five of them into something new. So um, yes, there's an opportunity to, I think, pick subject areas that are, uh, I would argue, universal in scope. So everybody teaches math. Everybody teaches biology. Everybody teaches statistics, chemistry. Um, you start getting into things like political science or the history of a particular region or country. Now you're getting into areas which are much more controversial. But th I would argue there are some, especially in the quote unquote hard sciences, computer science is another space where everybody can learn coding in any country around the world. And so there are particular subjects where we can and I think probably should think about how how can we divide and co conquer the responsibility and the resource allocations needed to produce really amazing educational resources, put an open license on those things, and then share them globally? I think if we want people to adopt it, though, um, you want to go with the most permissive license that you can. So that's probably a CC BY license. Uh, you want to 
uh, translate those resources into as many languages as possible. You want to make those resources easy to download and in editable file formats. So don't give me a PDF of a textbook. Give me, uh, give me editable text documents or give me an open office document or something that I can actually get my hands on and edit. Uh, and we want to give people choice. So we don't want to put out one calculus textbook. We want to put out 10. And then the next thing, the, the other thing we want to do is we want to make search and discovery super easy. So Creative Commons right now is uh, is writing code, and uh, which is, will all be uh, free software licensed. Uh, we're building a new CC search because we couldn't. We tried to get other search engines to create a, a search engine that would search the entire Commons, everything in the public domain, and everything that was openly licensed, and nobody would do it because there's no money in it, to be honest. <laughs> and so we're doing it. And so you got to make search and discovery easier. That's what CC Search is about. But we also, in, in uh, education, we also have to uh, have curated sets of resources so that we don't force people into a, a blind search, which, which can be very difficult, for, especially for novices. And so if somebody teaches chemistry, just show them chemistry. right? Just say, oh, you teach these three co courses? Here are the top rated. Uh, reviewed by your peers, uh, open textbooks, open courses, degree programs in chemistry. If you're interested in math, we've got that too. If you want biology, we've got that too. But it should be really, really easy, and they should have choice. Anyone else have a question? Uh, first, I will have to use the opportunity to thank you, Cable, um, not just for being here, it's very important, but also because of the inspiration that, um, and the possibilities that open licensing has given us. Without this inspiration and the open licensing, we wouldn't have been, it wouldn't be possible for us to make any delay or other things that we have done. Um, and also, I think it's uh, very important to acknowledge that the important work that you do, not just being here, but being everywhere. Um, because you learn uh, for us as well, and you can bring that to us now. And do you see any common obstacles? Uh, because I, what I see is that the different contexts between the different countries are so great. Some have free textbooks, some have not free textbooks, and it's a different um, subject. And also you have all these different things around the publishers, the unions, um, uh, the background for the country. Uh, the way forward, do you see any large common ground in terms of uh, what we have to do to get forward? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we were talking earlier today about what winning looks like and then how to get there. So in open education, I shouldn't speak for the whole field. In the Creative Commons open education platform, we have decided we are going to focus on three areas in open education. Content, OER, practices, open pedagogy and open practices, and policy, which we talked about today. So, and that's still very broad, but that's what we're going to focus our work on. So what does winning look like in those three areas? With content, I think winning, and you're right, some countries, uh, tuition is free at university, uh, textbooks are all included, there are no costs, and so the cost arguments I made today just don't matter. That's true in many countries in the Middle East and a few countries in Europe. For most of the rest of the world, cost is a big deal. Um, winning in content would be something like, and we could debate what this looks like, but for starters, it would be, what are the highest enrolled 250 courses at your university? So if we sat down with your registrar's office and I looked at your enrollments for this university, and what I would see is that your number one highest enrolled course is probably a basic writing course. Your number two course is probably intro to statistics. Your number three course is probably introduction to biology uh, or a computer science class. Uh, but, but the point is, is that your top 100 courses are exactly the same top 100 courses as Ohio State University which has the same top 100 courses as the University of Barcelona, which has the same top 100 courses as the University of Cape Town. Now they're all slight, they're named slightly different and they're in different orders, 
but we all teach basically the same stuff, right? So what does winning look like in content? I think a good starting point would be um, the top 250 highest enrolled courses that we all teach. Uh, all the content would be open, preferably CC by licensed if we can get it. Uh, textbooks, all the ancillary resources, all of the course curriculum, full open courseware, uh, and preferably the degree programs that go with them. You do that on content, and you take commercial, the problem of commercial publishing completely out of the picture. Commercial publishing now becomes work for hire for the academy through open procurement mechanisms. So if we need commercial publishers, we will hire them. But we, the Academy, will hold the copyright and we'll put a CC license on what we own. So that's content. And I would make the same arguments around uh, software. Uh, in the Academy, we should figure out what we need in terms of software for uh, running the ERP systems, for running the learning management systems, for uh, you know, uh, open office. We should uh, have a conversation. What do we need for software to run education? And then we should make the investments to make those free uh, software licensed works that are sustained with ongoing funds. So that's what winning looks like on content and code, I would argue. On practices, you're really talking about uh, instructional design and helping teachers think in new ways about what they can do with their students, when, especially when the content and the code they're using is open. And that has to start in their schools of education, preferably. So while they're being trained as faculty, while they're being trained as primary and secondary school teachers, there needs to be curriculum that's about the commons. So for example, one thing we didn't talk about today, Creative Commons just launched what we call the Creative Commons Certificate. And so this is an opportunity for people to take a 10-week online course or a one-week intensive face-to-face -face boot camp, we call them, and at the end of it, uh, you're an expert in many aspects of the commons and CC licensing and how they apply for your particular sector. So we have a CC certificate for educators, and we have a CC certificate for librarians. So they're kind of customized for the different audiences. Right now, we're building a CC certificate for GLAM. That'll be coming online next. We've got uh, one in draft for government. Uh, we may build one for researchers. So, um, and then of course, because we're Creative Commons, if you click here where it says certificate resources, we've made the full certificate downloadable in editable file formats under a CC BY license. So if somebody says, uh, look, I, I don't have 10 weeks, and really what I want to do is put together a, a one day workshop for NDLA participants, you can download the whole certificate, remix it, and do whatever you want. Right. Um, so, and we're, the reason I bring this up is part of winning at practices is taking something like this, turning it into a, a required course and putting it in schools of education, right? And I want this in schools of education for educators. I want this in mastery of library science programs for librarians so that future librarians are trained in these things. I'd like them to be in law schools so that all future lawyers that come out understand the commons and open licensing because today they don't. Uh, and then winning with policy, very frankly, is uh, all governments, all national governments in the world require that publicly funded resources are openly licensed by default, and all other funders, mainly foundations and research councils, do the same thing on educational resources, code, um, and uh, research. I see lots of questions. We sparked a conversation. <laughs> yep, I have a question. And uh, one more thing before we go to the next question, I should have lots of pitches to make here. Uh, Creative Commons just rebooted its network. So we've had a global network throughout our entire history and have had chapters, uh, country chapters around the world. And these are amazing people. They're volunteers in their countries, including uh, here in Norway. There's a CC Norway. And um, uh, there were a bunch of things that weren't working very well in the network. And so the network itself said, hey, we need a new strategy. We need to reboot. And so we've done that. And so if you go to network.creativecommons.org, you can uh, read all the documents. And the FAQs are here to tell you about what we're doing. It's, it says all the different ways you can get involved. One of the ways you can get involved is you can sign up to be an individual member of the network. By the way, this is all free. There's no membership fees. We just want people to be in the network who care about the commons and want to work on this stuff. So you can sign up to be an individual member. If you want your institution to sign up, you can do that. 
so as CC Norway kind of re reboots and sets up its chapter, we call these country chapters, what they'll do is they'll, um, and they've already started this process, but they will have a meeting and their meeting will invite all of the CC global network members that uh, reside in Norway. And those people will be invited in. And then what the chapter will do is it'll elect uh, two positions. One will be the, the public lead of CC Norway who will help set some strategy and oftentimes is the, uh, the person that speaks on behalf of the chapter to the government or other, uh, or other entities, sometimes the press. And the second person that gets elected is the representative to the uh, Creative Commons Global Council. So the CC Global Council is kind of like the UN General Assemb Assembly. Every country in the world gets one representative and then headquarters, CC headquarters where I work, I think we have two or three reps on that. But the idea is that global council will uh, grant money. They have a budget where they can grant uh, project money to the platforms like the CC Open Ed platform. They will set strategy for the global network as well. So if you're interested in any of that, that's how you can join CC. It's, a, it's an open invitation. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, this is not something that's inherently a problem with um, with um, uh, open uh, textbooks, but you mentioned work for hire uh, yeah. as opposed to off-the-shelf uh, textbooks. So one of the things that I've seen in software is that um, even though you might have specialized needs and the, the, there's definitely a need to do specialized software, um, there are so many different requirements and there is no good specification process so you actually end up uh, doing everything and nothing and squander a lot of money on making um, uh, the uh, the software and um, so so you might even end up getting a better product but just choosing something from off the shelf mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine the same thing more or less happening if you want to do textbooks in the same way. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good point. Um, even though you can tell I'm a strong advocate for open, there is a role for closed uh, materials. Um, just So you just made the point that sometimes there's a role for buying uh, software off the shelf. And uh, because it meets an immediate need and it's going to be cheaper than building it yourself, uh, some free software people might argue vigorously with you on that point. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a point well taken. Uh, I would argue the same thing is true of educational resources. So when I said winning in content, so let's, um, let's take a more reasonable phase one goal of what winning looks like. The top 100 highest enrolled courses, I would argue, would probably disrupt the content market significantly toward open. Um, I think that's about all we would need is the top 100 highest enrolled courses. And the good news is we probably already have the top 40 or 50, so we're on our way. Uh, we don't have 10 versions of each, but we've got one or two versions of each globally. Um, what about number 436 highest enrolled course that's some obscure doctoral course that's taught here at the university that seven graduate students take a year. Are we ever gonna produce open educational resources for that? I hope so. I hope that that faculty member says, hey, this is, <laughs> this is still an important subject. I teach it, means a lot to me. Um, I want, part of my legacy is I want people to still know about this stuff even after I retire or die. And so I wanna make it open so that my good work lives on. Um, but it's possible that the only really high quality resources for that particular subject is off the shelf. And it doesn't, it's not gonna make a lot of sense to invest a lot of money to build it as OER because there are so few students and you don't get the economies of scale. And so, yes, I think it's also true, well, I know that it's true that there are some things that are impossible to get open. So for example, if I'm teaching a, uh, a modern literature course, and I want to assign my students novels, um, books that are in publication now, where the author is still alive and is on the, you know, the New York Times bestsellers list, there's no way I'm gonna get that book open. It's just not gonna happen, but I, that's the book that I want to assign. And so it's possible that most of the content in my course is open, but I'm gonna assign some closed materials as well. And we have to be, as advocates, flexible and not be too dogmatic so that faculty can do what faculty need to do in their classrooms. 
Yeah. Um, I'll try to explain um, with my limited uh, language competency, but um, I meet professionals um, high up in their areas and they are skeptical in using the Creative Commons more open than the non-derivative. Because to them uh, there is a chance, there's a risk, that if it gets altered, uh, the quality will be lower afterwards. And especially in the risk uh, activities industry and within areas where the consequence of, ris of, of using a derivative article which has a lower quality than the original um, um, has big consequences, maybe loss of lives or big injuries and so on. How would you answer that skepticism? So, so I have two answers for that. It's an excellent point. Um, the first answer is that Creative Commons has this whole suite of license, licenses to meet different needs. So f uh, for example, sometimes the, um, the World Bank will put out um, you know, the definitive global report on poverty. And they've collected all the data over multiple years and they've reviewed it and their boards have signed off on it and they say, this is it. This is the report on poverty. We want every country in the world to have no changes, right? And so sometimes they'll drop an ND license, usually this one. They'll drop a buy ND license out for that reason. They just really don't want any derivative works out there because it's so important to them that people see the work in its entirety and they don't see excerpts of it taken out of context. And so that might be a really good use of ND. That doesn't make it OER. OER has a particular set of conditions and that's okay. It doesn't mean we wouldn't use it in education. We just wouldn't call it OER. Another, so that's the legal answer. I would say to them, hey, if ND is what you need, then use ND, we've got those licenses. Um, the other answer is um, copyright law and by extension, open copyright licenses, these things, don't stop bad people from doing bad things. So what I mean by that if, is if somebody wants to plagiarize a work or um, I'll, I'll use a, uh, an extreme example to make my point. Let's say that um, uh, a, you know, some white supremacist wants to take a Jewish studies course and use it for white supremacy propaganda purposes, right? That person doesn't really care about copyright law or which CC license is on the work, right? So what we see is that um, people that, that intend to do harm to somebody else's work, like take things out of context or not give proper attribution, or remix in a way that is really quite abusive to the original work, those tend to not be good actors anyway, and licensing is kind of irrelevant. What we, we also see the opposite. We see that when people put Creative Commons licenses on their works, it's actually a learning moment for them, and I'll show you why. So um, I'll go back to our website just as an example. So, here we are on the Creative Commons website. And just like any website, if I scroll, let me make it bigger so you can see it. Just like any website, when I scroll to the bottom, I can find the terms of use. Like what am I allowed to do with the content on this site? So this one says, except where otherwise noted, content on this site is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution 4.0 international license icons or by the noun project. The website was created by Affinity Bridge. So we've given attribution to these different players that we, that we use and, and then the company that helped us build the site. We didn't have to do that. They were work for hire, but they did good work. We wanted to, to say thank you. Here's the learning moment. And, you'll, and there's 1.2 billion of these things floating around the web, right? There's lots of them. Here's the learning moment. Oftentimes, if I run into a site and it just says CNN all rights reserved copyright, people don't really know what that means, right? They say, oh, I'm on the web, it's free. I can copy and paste, I can link to it, I can do whatever I want, right? And they just sort of do it. With CC licenses, people link to the license. And so here I am, 
make it smaller now so you can see it. And this is the CC BY license, and this is what's called the human readable deed. And so this is one page, right, nice and simple. And here it is in Norwegian. Right, so one page, and it tells me very simply what rights do I have and under what conditions. The copyright doesn't tell me this, right? So already the person, the, the famous professor that, um, it, that wants to communicate what rights they want to extend and what rights they don't can use the license to do that, including if they use an ND license. So this is helpful. Um, the other thing that's true is that um, oftentimes when faculty say that to me, I'm careful how I say this, but sometimes, to be totally honest, their position is a bit arrogant. Um, I, th I, I would argue that, um, we were having this conversation earlier, most work, I don't care if it's research or an educational resource or a piece of code, it can be improved, right? Somebody else has a good idea. We used to say, um, where I worked at uh, this community college uh, system, uh, when we talked about open education, we would say, um, we can never hire all the best chemistry professors in the world. It's not gonna happen. So for us not to use the best chemistry OER from Norway and other places around the world, that's just pure arrogance on our part. We need to be open to the idea that there are other smart people around the world that do research, that can code, and that create educational resources. And we need to be grateful and say thank you and take those openly licensed works and use them. And so I'd be careful how I would say that to that faculty member, but everything can be made better. And that's the problem with ND is it locks it down so it can't be improved. Uh -huh. Which is risk activity, and where we do risk assessment of all parts we we follow. This is like a, a water activity. And if anyone else but five, six people in Norway edited that content, it would probably have lower quality afterwards, because we are testing on these parts all the time, sure. and the consequence sure. could be a death. Someone jumped off a cliff at eight meters, and they didn't do the risk assessment we do. Yeah. And someone took out the line from there and said, "You should not jump to the right at that point because they would just wanted it to make it shorter." Yeah. Someone pr would probably die, and and those experts on that path on that activity, they they wouldn't like to uh, risk that at all. So they wouldn't like to put anything else but an ND on that paper. So that's a really good example where, um, where process and timing matters a lot. So for things like that, if I was consulting with that project, I would say, tell me about your risks and your concerns. And based on what you just said, I would probably say, I wouldn't share those resources with anybody for a while until you were confident that you had them in good shape. Then you might want to put an ND license on them for a period of time and see what happens. The nice thing about Creative Commons licenses is you can always relicense a work. So as the copyright holder, maybe you start with, a, with an ND license, but maybe nothing bad happens for a year. And you say, oh, well, we know that ND is shutting down anybody from giving us new ideas or improving the work. Maybe let's open it to a buy SA license, to a share-like license, and force sharing forward. And then maybe eventually you get to a CC BY license. But that's your uh, prerogative to change the license as you see fit. The same people would say that they don't want to share their content because if someone read what they have of high quality and fell off a cliff, they will feel guilty. So that, that sort of sharing me mechanism of dropping things out there would, would sort of flip both ways in that case. I don't know uh, how familiar you are with uh, European copyright, um, but at least the answer in part to this question is something called ideal rights in the European copyright which also provides the means to disassociate yourself from uh, any derivative works. 
M moral rights. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, but yeah, there there is more there, but yeah. Yeah, and the um, one of the things that we do with the Creative Commons licenses, because they're international licenses, is whenever we version the licenses, it's a big it's a big deal, and it's a global conversation. And uh, so when we version from three to four, we're at four right now. Um, the Europeans were there ensuring that moral rights were protected, et cetera. So the license, if you go into the license, so this is the human readable deed, and if you go to the top, um, there's, this is the actual legal code for the license. And you can go in here and you'll see a description of how moral rights, for example, are, are handled. Yeah, um, just a quick comment first for the discussion just now. Um, I'm uh, pretty heavily uh, involved in some open source communities, and uh, the the pattern we use, in, in which is common there, is that a small group of, of people who are, who know what's going on have access to change the the text, and uh, people who want to give feedback or report on uh, on inaccuracies or something, they go through these people. We, 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 those people in our language would have a commit bit. They, they, they have the authority to actually make the changes. Right. So you have the conversation around that. So that would maybe solve some of that problem, but it would perhaps open up uh, more questions around how to manage a text or a project in this case. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you've covered much of that today, but that's an interesting topic all by itself. It, uh, it is, and I, my hope is that one day, Educational resources will actually be on Git, on, on Git, something like GitHub, where people can share ideas and then we can commit changes and we're just not there yet. I, I would say that it would be a requirement for success actually, but all right. Uh, yes. my, my actual question is um, uh, in all the thing, interesting things you've been talking about today and, and that we covered today, it seems to me that uh, one participant in today's like environment isn't being t included uh, much and that is the the old school publishers and i'm assuming that if everything goes well and uh, we, we win uh, we get all the successes we're looking for and we get all the benefits those uh, old school publishers the traditional uh, big and small publishing houses, they would still want to stay alive in some way. Um, and uh, my question to you is, are, are there one or two or three or five um, things or advices you would give to a, a publishing house uh, uh, so that they can change on how they work in such a way that they work with the open communities instead of against them uh, uh, in the ways that some of them do today. Yes, I even have a document on this topic that I'll bring up here. Publishers already in Norway today, setting up shop, new project based on Norwegian digital learning, uh, learning arena. Um, and, and that's pretty cool, but that's totally new. It has never happened before. So, so I have a, a, a couple answers to this question. So first, I will be uh, blunt and direct and somewhat rude to existing publishers. So I had uh, a good friend, his name's Hal Plotkin. He worked in, the pre in Obama's administration in the Department of Education. And publishers would show up to the US Department of Education and they were angry that the Department of Education was talking about and supporting open education. And my friend Hal would say, what did it say on the building outside when you walked in? And they'd say, uh, I don't know, we, we, didn't, we didn't see. He says, it says, Department of Education. Our job is education, providing resources to help people get an education. And it's our job as public stewards of the public resources and money and the solemn obligation we have to the public to get an education. That's our job and we will use every tool in our toolbox to do that. And near as we can tell, open education is a way better model 
than the closed model. It does not say Department of Publishing. Our job is not to protect existing publishing models. Now, we're not trying to put you out of business. We are not anti-publisher. We don't seek to see any harm come to you. It's just that we, it's not our responsibility as the government in this case, to prop up your business models with public money. That's not our job. That might be your job. It's not our job. Our job is to make sure everybody gets an education, right? So that's my blunt answer. Um, and the way that I would say that from Creative Commons is we're, we're agnostic as to what the publishing market looks like. I, I honestly don't care that much because for the most part, we exist in a free market capitalistic system where markets adjust to meet opportunities. And if the world's governments started to say, uh, here's a bunch of public money to build the educational resources that we need for our publics to get an education, and we want to hire people to build that stuff. Odds are the, the existing publishers are best positioned to respond to those tenders or those RFPs and take those contracts and do the work. And I hope that they do. So I do care that they exist and that they're successful so that a publishing industry is there to answer that call. But I think it's also true that even if some of them fail, so if Pearson went bankrupt and went away, some new entrepreneurial publisher is gonna to emerge to fill the gap because there's gonna be a you know 200,000 kroner tender that goes out to produce math materials. Somebody's gonna step forward and say, I will do it. So I'm not worried about that. Um, the other thing is this, is how do we help them understand open and shift toward open so that they can succeed, but succeed on our terms? And what I mean is how do they, how are they good stewards of the commons? How can they give back and support the open education movement? So this is just a brainstorm list that many of us use. And I actually use this list when I'm talking with publishers. So, um, so I talk with publishers all the time. I've been to Pearson headquarters. I spoke with Wiley Publishing last week. I talk with McGraw-Hill on a regular basis, right? And pub other publishers around the world. So I, I don't yell at publishers. I don't tell them I wish they'd go out of business. Quite the contrary, I try to help them. And what I say to them is, uh, you should be open and transparent about what you're charging for. So if you don't charge for content, tell people what you do charge for. What you're charging for these days is data analytics. And that's student data, which is controversial because that gets into privacy issues and you're holding student data. And when the universities are canceling the contracts with you, you take all that student data and you need to be more transparent about that because we're not happy about it. We, the academy, are not happy about that. So they're trying to figure out how to have that conversation. Um, but in, in a you know sort of an honest way, just say what you're charging for. Second, um, if you're going to share some of your content, please share it under a CC BY license. Don't share it under an NC license. Share it in the most open way you can. Um, properly mark your work with, if you're saying something is OER, properly mark it with a CC license. Don't call things that are free, all rights reserved, copyright OER, because it's not. Right? So don't mix free and open. Um, Host all the your materials on a website where people can download it. It shouldn't be in editable file formats. Uh, you know, publish in open formats wherever possible. Uh, provide clear definitions of OER, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure your terms of service don't conflict with the license. So a lot of times, uh, publishers will say, uh, "You can download all of our content under this CC license," and then in the next paragraph, it'll say, "You may not download any of our content." where you know, it's like a direct conflict in their TOS. And so what we do is we give them this list and then Creative Commons says to them, and we will help you. So go ahead and adjust your terms of service and then send me the paragraph and I'll review it. And we don't, we don't even charge them for this. We just say, we, we wanna help. And so we, we're trying to be helpful and productive. At the same time, we're also trying to disrupt the market. I don't know if it's inconsistent to do both at the same time, but we do. I just wanted to follow up on the moral rights uh, question. Um, in the US, uh, when something is in the public domain, then uh, moral rights are also uh, not applicable. But in the rest of the world, in Europe in general, um, moral rights still do apply. Uh, and one problem with that is uh, where do you draw the line? For instance, you mentioned this example with um, 
with um, a juice and a white supremacist mm -hmm. using the juice material, mm -hmm. which would be um, probably kind of clear cut for any court to decide. But what about a political party? I, I mean, a regular political party using the works which was uh, licensed, uh, CC licensed by another political party. How far do they have to be removed? Uh, does it matter if the one party is socialist and the other one is conservative, or where do you draw the line? So you can have a lot of conflicts there. And um, and that leads also to the second problem with moral rights, which is that it has not been standardized between countries. Uh, so, th so the moral rights are very different from one country to the next. And even, even when they look similar, they are not. For instance, in Norway and in Canada, it is the same moral rights. But in Canada, they end at the same time as the economic rights, the corporate rights. But in Norway, the, the, the same moral rights that the Canadians have, in Norway, these rights are um, eternal. They last forever. Mm -hmm. For example, so um, how how so my question is um, has Creative Commons as an organization how how do you meet how have, have you had problems with the moral rights in different jurisdictions? So th this is in our FAQ, um, and I should have pointed this out earlier. If you go to the web and type in Creative Commons FAQ, you'll get this huge list of FAQs, and these are questions we get from around the world, including how do Creative Commons licenses affect my moral rights, if at all? And one of the things that we did with the 4.0 licenses that I highlighted here is if you put a 4.0 license on your material, you agree to waive and not assert any moral rights you have to the limit, to limit extent necessary to allow the public to exercise the licensed rights in the CC license. This is designed to minimize the effect of moral rights on licenses' ability to use the work and ensure that the license works internationally as intended. So if you wanted to retain your moral rights on a particular work, our advice is don't put a CC 4.0 license on that work. Yeah, well, what this is saying is really, this is going, so we call it, um, or the lawyers call them licensors and licensees. So the licensor is the copyright holder. That might be you, if you own the work, if you built it. Um, yeah, if you, I mean, I, I think to me this is clear. What this is saying is that if you, if you wanted to exercise your moral rights on that work in the future, you probably don't want to add a CC 4.0 license to it. Guys, I mean, we've been at it for an hour nearly. That's that's so cool. I think so. Um, I just <laughs> want to round up saying thank you to Cable. Uh, you're doing another talk uh, at the Technology Houston tomorrow. Um, and I will say that this discussion with the questions you guys have raised, it it draws some lines for me personally back to the open source discussion in the beginning of the 2000s. And the same skeptic people, they ask more or less the same questions. And at one point, those questions weren't raised anymore. So for instance, the publishers now, they, they, they have to shift their, their models. Mm -hmm. At one point, we all know that the big exec without any here said that open source was cancer. He worked at Microsoft. Uh, at one point, Microsoft, they actually bought GitHub. Um, so they changed their models, they changed their ways, and the discussion actually more or less went away. But not here in, in Norway, not for the public sector in Norway, it still is the same old, same old. But the good thing here is that we see some of the same thoughts now. I mean, even Bill Gates and his, his um, f foundation has, has changed mm -hmm. entirely in terms of, of policies. So maybe now in 10 years, the OER community will be where the open source and free software community is today. So thank you, Cable. Um, and thank you guys for following us on the stream. And for you guys in the room, asking all the intelligent questions. Great, thank you.